Okay. So we're here to talk about smart boards, right? And you're all teachers, so you're going to be probably running into the, this kind of technology. Does anybody here know what a smart board is? What's a smart board? Um, it's like a big, like a big touch screen almost. That's right. When I touch the screen, it's a way of interfacing with the computer in the same way that I might with a mouse. There are other things I can do. For example, I can take this pen and I can make a mark. I can take it and I can erase it. But the benefit is that I'm actually, I'm actually making marks that I can record. Like if I was using a regular whiteboard, I could still project on it, but I wouldn't be able to do anything really interactively with it. I could still make marks on it, but I couldn't record the marks the way that I can with this. And we're going to demonstrate that. So, You can see, like, when I click on this, when I click on the screen, sometimes it's not registering correctly, and we're going to fix that. I'm going to show you how to do that. Here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about connections. In other words, how does this all work? We're going to talk about the interface. In other words, this touch screen itself. We're going to talk about Notebook, which is actually an application that smart technologies, which make smart boards, uh, uses in order for you to record the marks. We're going to talk about Google Earth which I think is a really cool application to use on something like this. We're going to talk about keyboarding, alignment, right click, and then I'm going to show you a video about a guy named Johnny Lee who is doing this in a different way. The first thing I want to talk about is connections. So what we have here is about a $1,500 investment. If you already have a projector, which many classrooms already do, just this smart board is like an extra 1500 bucks. It, it could be cheaper, could be more, depending on the size. And the way that it works is you have USB. Does anybody know, any, what's USB? Flash drive? Yeah. A flash drive, right. So, for example, I don't know if I have my flash drive with me. I don't, but a USB flash drive, for example, is a little piece of USB memory that you can plug directly into your computer and you can have that be, um, a way to store files. We're using USB here to communicate with the smart board though. There's a wire that's plugged in right here and it's going through the wall and going over to the back of my computer where it's plugged in via USB. Uh, there are other ways to do it, like you can use serial uh, cables and such, but USB is the most common way. There are, hi, how are you? There are also LEDs. So for example, there's this indicator here, and I actually have more than one smart board on this campus. And other smart boards, if, if you don't see this green light, for example, you know that there's a connection problem. And also, when you have a marker picked up, one thing happens is that you get a different uh, icon here, and you get an LED showing you that you have the green marker picked, or the blue marker picked up. If you don't see that, you, um, there may be something wrong with your connection. You may have to like pull it out and put it back in. Quite honestly, we haven't had many problems with these. Once it's set up, you more or less can forget about it. But you can't have the length of the cable, because of the limitations of USB as a technology, you can't have the length of the cable be over 30 feet. So going through the wall, around and over, can't be more than 30 feet. So I couldn't have the computer over there, for example, and use USB. So first things first, we're going to align. And the way that we do that is we click on this little uh, question mark button here. And what happens is you get this little help support thing. We're going to click on this. And it says, hold that, hold that, hold that, hold that, hold that, hold that. And now, now when I click, it really is exactly where it's supposed to be. Okay. The other thing that you should know is that there are different kinds of smart boards. For example, there are LCD-based smart boards. There are LCDs like this that actually have this technology built right in. And so those are a lot more expensive than the $1,500 interface we have here. But for this kind of thing, they also have smart boards where they have a portable projector. They have ones that have arms, like sort of sticking out like this, where the projector is right there. 
They have other ones where the projector is like on a cart. But the problem with that is that you have to align every time you walk up to the thing. And so you have to go through that little thing that we just did every time you walk up to it. With this, we have a pretty stable situation. We have a stable projector, a stable smart board, nothing moves, and so I don't have to align very often. So just something to keep in mind, there are a lot of different kinds of solutions for smart boards. This is just one particular kind of setup. If you go like this, it automatically gives you the ability to make a mark. Or at least it's supposed to. Let's find out why that's doing that. You pick up the marker, it automatically makes it into a marker. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm walking late. Um, um, the smart board is basically the computer with the touch screen, I assume, and then you have the ability to write on it. Well, the computer's a computer, and the computer's right. over here. Smart board is really just a, a touch screen. Touch screen. And okay. the, the projector is actually projecting this image on here. Okay. And so the projector is its own cost, and then the smart board is like 1500 bucks. Okay. So okay. it's basically a touch screen that you can use in addition to the computer. Right. It, it really has no function without a computer. You have to have right. a computer hooked up. It can be a Mac or a PC, right? Okay. Thank you. And it has all the basic functionality of just a whiteboard, but it also has this extra functionality that we're talking about with the with um, interaction with computers. The thing is that, let's say that I wanted to take two at a time. It, it doesn't work. I mean, if I take this blue marker while I have the green marker out, it's going to be green. It, it only chooses one color at a time, which is kind of a weird thing. Now, if I try and do this with the eraser, the, er the last thing I pick up will be active. But know that these are all going to act like erasers too. So if you, for example, whoops, if you're not paying attention and you, you know, one of these falls on the ground or something, it's not going to work the way that you expect. You, you sort of have to be aware if I have a blue one and I pick up another one, it's going to be the latest one that you picked up. Okay. The other thing is that you see all that see that little um, notification that <laughs> says "click here to restore writing." If you don't actually go through the trouble to save the marks that you make outside of a specific application like Notebook you will lose that writing. In the same way that I just made these marks and they're lost, if you're not actually working in something like Notebook, which is the specific application, and you don't like take a screen capture of the screen, you'll lose that stuff. In order to save it, there are a couple things you can do. Okay, so let's say that I wanted to make a mark like this. And I wanted to save that. I, I get this little platform here, and I can capture that portion of the screen. It automatically throws it into Notebook, and opens it up here. This is Notebook. So what I've done is essentially captured a portion of my screen with that mark on there brought it into this application, and now I'm able to capture marks like this, and I won't lose them when I click away, okay? So you should just be aware that if I'm in this application here and I'm making marks, I may lose them if I don't do something special, like do a rec uh, recording. <coughs> Also, every time you do a capture, it does a new slide. I can add as many slides as I want. Right. And I can come in here and come on. Okay. But, so just be aware that if you're outside of that application, you have to do something in order to not lose that stuff. Let's talk about notebook. So, this is Notebook, as I said. One thing that I can do is I can insert, for example, a picture. Like this, right? 
And once it's in here, I can use the markers. <laughs> you notice I just hit it with the edge of my hand, and it's like you just have to sort of get used to that idea that if, if you bump it or something, or if you try and hit it in two places, it's going to freak out a little bit. It's going to be like, why? <laughs> <laughs> so, but what's really cool about this is I've made a mark. What I can't do on a whiteboard that I can do with this is I can do that, okay? I can also resize it, right? Woo! I can also, <laughs> this is kind of cool. It sees this mark as a potential word. In other words, I might have wrote, wrote the word John on this. And if I wanted to, I could say, recognize this as an O instead. And so it made it into an O. Okay? Which is kind of cool. If I want to add slides, I can add as many slides as I want just by hitting this icon. If I want to go back and forth between slides, I can. And it's almost like PowerPoint, in a sense. In other words, if you start to think about this as like a specific kind of PowerPoint or a presentation tool, you can really make this be very powerful. Okay. You can do some fun things too. I mean, these are kind of like, just kind of cute, but you can do stuff like that. You, you, one of the, really the coolest things I think is that you can use linear tools like this, right? So if I wanted to, let's say that I wanted to do a diagram. So I could choose my text tool and let's say type and I'll, show you, for example, right? So I've made a piece of text. Whoops. And made another piece of text. Made another piece of text. And so I can use this linear tool in order to make connections between those things. Hmm. Okay? And then I can still use my markers. Note that when I'm using my eraser and I have these linear tools or these text tools, it doesn't erase in the same way. It only erases things that I make with the markers. Okay? If I wanted to delete this, I could just select it and say delete. I want to undo that. I can undo it. Let me show you something else while we're here. We'll use a tool called the Infinite Cloner. And what that does is allows me to clone that. Why is that not working? And so it becomes essentially an object that I can just repeat as many times as I want. This could be a picture, it could be a piece of text, it could be whatever I want. So this is all just to show you, this is a very powerful tool. I mean, just as powerful as PowerPoint, but it does all this other stuff that's really smart board related, okay? Well, that's a good question, but I mean, because of the tactile nature of what I'm doing, yes. the internet really removes me from that, right? Okay. So if you think about it, like, uh, for example, I'm doing a recording here, and if you go to lamesney.com later on, you'll be able to see this video on lamesney.com. Okay. So I'm using a smart board, and I'm using the internet in order to teach, but I'm not necessarily doing this, those things at the same time. There are ways where I could use SmartBoard in order to, let's say that you were in front of your computer right now. I could use a camera like a webcam and I could have that streaming 
like at Ustream.tv, for example. Yeah. Uh, and you could, you could go to that site and go and watch this right now. But it wouldn't necessarily, the smart board wouldn't add or remove anything from that experience. Right, you know because I mean? the students wouldn't be able to interact. Yeah, I mean, part of, the, part of the con of distance learning, for example, is that there's no tactile presence, right? It, the best you can do is video, probably. Right. Um, there is a technology called haptics that um, a, a colleague of mine is actually looking into right now. And that's the, the idea of haptics is that you're somewhere in France and I'm somewhere here. And due to the hardware that we have each in our own rooms, we can interact ta in a tactile way. Like it might be gloves or something and we might be able to sign on to Second Life and I might be able to hand you an object in Second Life using these gloves, you know what I mean? Yes. But that has nothing to do with this. You so know what I mean? It's video game. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me show you one of my favorite tools, if it's what, installed. Can you spell that for me, Haptics? <coughs> H-A-P-T-I-C-S. H-A-P-T-I-C-S? H-A-P-T-I-C-S. Haptics. You all know Google Earth? Okay. There's a little button right here next to the question mark button that we were talking about earlier. Okay. You just click on this, it pops up when you're done with it. What's the question? Can you explain all the buttons on the, start, on the bottom again? Sorry. The one there's, the there's really just three. There's one that's keyboard button, one that okay. is a right click button, and one that's the question mark button. And the question, question mark, mark, button mark button does this. So it allows you to align the smart board, which I guess happened before most okay. of you showed up. So let's say that we wanted to take a ride down 206. Right? There's 95. Mm. There's Lawrenceville. <laughs> right, so I'm like taking the planet and spinning it. I think that's a really cool thing. You know, it's, it's <laughs> like... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Go faster. <laughs> I went off track. Hold on. Okay, let's show roads. All right, so here's 206. Oh, actually... Yes. <laughs> How much is one of these? <laughs> this is 1500 bucks. And, and the projector, which is like another 1500 bucks. But you should know that most of the classrooms that you're going in are likely to have at least one of these on site, hopefully a lot more over time. And they're making it so that they're single units. Like I said, uh, they have ones that are LCD based that it's just a touch screen in a box like this. You hang it up on the wall and you're done. But that's like three grand. 
Maybe. Yeah. Is that yours? Did you like carry that here? The smart board? Yeah. No, it's this is permanent installation in this room. Yeah. We have one. <laughs> we have several. We have some in Memorial actually. The only but the only reason gone. why we didn't do this in Memorial is because this is my space. And so I knew that this would be available, as opposed to something in Memorial where I didn't know whether it would be available, whether I was, you know, going to be following some. I didn't know. Like, I didn't know. Is this in conjunction also with Mac computers? Or yes, it's available for Mac, PC, yeah. Linux could probably use it. And what technology are we using for PCs? Like, are we using Vista or? Well, Either or. I mean, they, they have it for Vista, they have it, you could probably get it to run on Windows 3.1 if you wanted to. No, who would want to do that, but. <laughs> okay, so let me show you something else. You can also do this. Right? Surprise. I mean, isn't that cool, you know, it's like. Now, let's say I wanted to go to Absolutely love that. But with a smart board, it's like you start to have this tactile interface that you can really play, right? And when you find applications like this, you, you tend to gravitate towards them when you have a smart board because it allows for a lot of interactive play. Yes? Um, what about the camera icons for? Oh, that shows that a picture was taken from okay. that point of view. Great, thank you. Yeah. Can you get rid of them? Yeah, it's just a layer. So, for example, if I said, um, take off take off geographic so a whole bunch of things you can turn on and turn off but those layers can give you a lot of extra great information I mean depending on the photos for example have you all heard about uh, Street View in Google Earth so we'll go to um, <coughs> I must, I must have an older version of Google Earth, but there's actually this thing called Street View where you can actually see in a 360 view what's going on at the street level. And so like Google has actually come under fire and gotten into lawsuits because people are like getting photos taken of them automatically as people just drive along, <laughs> like Google people. And uh, like they're caught like with their girlfriend and their wife sees it. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. <coughs> okay, that's Google Earth. <laughs> so we talked about keyboarding. Uh, we we actually already showed keyboarding, right? If I click on that icon, it brings up the keyboard. You should always keep the keyboard nearby because this is a really ineffective way to do anything of any real import. You know, I can type in a few characters, but 
The other thing is, if this is the only way, hi, if this is the only way that I'm uh, allowing people to get to, uh, oh, thank you very much. If this is the only way that I'm, I have to put in a password, for example, I don't want to come up here and like type in my password in front of everybody, right? So th the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> you want to do it from the keyboard. The other button that I did not talk about is this right click button. So when I click on this button and then hit the screen, it offers me a context menu. And the benefit to that, of course, is that whenever you, you know, there's lots of things you can only do with a right click. So I may not want to have to walk over to my screen in order to right click. Um, <coughs> if I wanted to right click, right? I want to do certain things that are in context to this particular link. I can't do that without running over to my mouse. And if you're over, if you're over in front of the, mar of the smart board, you don't necessarily want to have to keep on running back and forth. So that's a really quick way to just get over there and take care of something. And that doesn't affect it if it's, you're using Mac because Mac doesn't need to right click. Mac does have a context it's, it's menu. Apple and well, it's actually control. Okay. But okay. if if you hit this button, it will do the, do the control thing. Okay. So finally, we talked about this being fifteen hundred bucks, right? How would you like to do it for forty? Yes, please. Let me. So as researchers, something we often do is use immense resources to achieve certain capabilities or achieve certain goals. And this is essential to the progress of science or exploration of what is possible. But it sort of creates this unfortunate situation where a tiny, tiny fraction of the world can actually participate in this exploration or can benefit from that technology. And something that motivates me and what gets me really excited about my research is when I see simple opportunities to drastically change that distribution and make the technology accessible to a much wider percentage of the population. And I'm going to show you two videos that have gotten a lot of attention recently uh, that I think embody this philosophy. And they actually use uh, the Nintendo Wii remote. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this device, it's a $40 uh, video game controller, and it's mostly advertised for its motion sensing capability, so you can swing a tennis racket or hit a baseball bat. Um, but what actually interests me a lot more is the fact that in the tip of each controller is a relatively high-performing infrared camera. And uh, I'm going to show you two demos of why this is useful. So here I have my computer set up with a projector, and I have a Wii remote sitting on top of it. And if, for example, if you're in a school that doesn't have a lot of money, which is probably a lot of schools, or if you're in an office environment and you want an interactive whiteboard, uh, normally these cost about two to $3,000. So what I'm going to show you how to do it is how to create one with a Wii remote. Now, uh, this requires another piece of hardware, which is this infrared pen. Uh, you can probably make this yourself for about $5 with a quick trip of a Radio Shock. It's essentially got a battery, a button, and an infrared LED, and it turns on. You guys can't see it, but it turns on whenever I push the button. Now, what this means is that if I run this piece of software, uh, I can now register. The camera sees the infrared dot, and I can register the location of the camera pixels to the projector pixels, and now this is an interactive whiteboard surface. For, so for about $50 of hardware, you can have your own whiteboard. This is uh, Adobe Photoshop. He did not spend $3,000 to do that. He spent 45. <laughs> Now, the software for this I've actually put on my website and, gave, and have let people download it for free. And the three months that this project has been public, uh, it's been downloaded over half a million times. So teachers and students all around the world are already using this. I want to 
quickly say that although it does do it for $50, there, is, there are some limitations of this approach, but you get about 80% of the way there for about 1% of the cost. Another nice thing is that a camera can see multiple dots. So this is actually a multi-touch interactive whiteboard system as well. Uh, for the second demo, I have this week. So the benefit there is that I, if I, I spent the $3,000, right? And if I pick up two pens, it only recognizes one. For his $45 solution, he has multi-touch, which is like you all know about the, I, the iPhone. iPhone where you can like zoom in by taking two fingers and going like that. He, he's doing that with his technology. I can't do that and I spend all the extra money. Remote that's actually next to the TV, so it's pointing away from the display rather than um, <coughs> pointing at the display. And uh, what, why this is interesting, oh, here they are, is that if you put on, say, a pair of safety glasses that have two infrared dots in them, what these two dots are essentially going to give you is give the computer an approximation of your head location. And why this is interesting is I have this little application running on the computer monitor, which has a 3D room with some targets floating in it. And you can see that it looks like a 3D room if you can, you can see, you know, like a video game, it sort of looks 3D, but for the most part, the image looks pretty flat and bound to the surface of the screen. But if we turn, turn on head tracking, the computer can change the image that's on the screen and make it respond to the head movement. So let's switch back to that. <laughs> so, so this has actually been a little bit startling to the game development community. Uh, <laughs> because this is about $10 of additional hardware if you already have a Nintendo Wii. So uh, I'm looking forward to some seeing some games with it. And actually, Lewis Castle, uh, sitting down there, last week announced that Electronic Arts, one of the largest game publishers, is releasing a game in May that has a little Easter egg feature for st supporting this type of head tracking. So in less, from five, in less than five months, it went from a prototype in my lab to a major commercial product. <laughs> Uh, but actually, to me, what's almost more interesting than either of these two projects is, projects is how people actually found out about them. YouTube has really changed the way or changed the speed in which a single individual can actually spread an idea around the world. Uh, I, you know, I'm just a research. Okay, so I want to show you one more idea that sort of goes in another complete direction. Does anybody here know who Jeff Han is? Good. Uh, what's the website for this? Website? This is TED, TED, uh, dot com. This is an amazing video. to show you some stuff that's just ready to come out of the lab, literally, and I'm really glad that you guys are going to be amongst the first to be able to see it in person because I really, really think this is going to change, really change the way we interact with machines from this point on. Now, um, this is a reprojected drafting table. It's about 36 inches wide, and it's equipped with a multi-touch sensor. Now, normal touch sensors that you see, like on a kiosk or interactive whiteboards, can only register kind of one point of contact at a time. This thing allows you to have multiple points at the same time. They can use both my hands, I can use cording options, I can just go right up and use all 10 fingers if I wanted to, you know, like that. Now, multi-touch sensing isn't anything, isn't completely new. I mean, people like Bill Buxton have been playing around with in the 80s. However, the approach I built here is actually high resolution, low cost, and probably most importantly, very scalable. So uh, the technology, you know, isn't, isn't the most exciting thing here right now, other than probably its newfound accessibility. What's really interesting here is kind of what you can do with it and the kind of interfaces you can build on top of it. So let's see. So for instance, we have a lava lamp application here. Now you can see, in, in, I can use both of my hands to kind of squeeze together and put the lava together. I can inject heat into the system here. 
or I can pull it apart with two of my fingers. It's completely intuitive. There's no instruction manual. The interface just kind of disappears. This started out as kind of a screen saver app that one of the PhD students in our lab, Ilya Rosenberg, made. But uh, I think it's true kind of true uh, identity comes out here. Now, what's great about a multi-touch sensor is that you know I could be doing this with as many fingers here. But of course, multi-touch also inherently means multi-user. So Chris could be out here interacting with another part of lava while I kind of play around with it here. You can imagine a kind of new kind of sculpting tool where I'm kind of warming something up, kind of making it malleable, and then kind of letting it cool down and solidifying a certain state. Google should have something like this in their lobby. <laughs> I'll show you something a little more of a concrete example here uh, as this thing loads. Now, this is a ph photographer's light box application. Again, I can use both of my hands to kind of interact and move photos around. But what's even cooler is that if I have two fingers, I can actually grab a photo and then stretch it out like that really easily. I can pan, zoom, and rotate it effortlessly. I can do that grossly with both of my hands, or if I can do it, just move two, two fingers on each of my hands together. If I grab the canvas, I can kind of do the same thing, stretch it out. I can do it simultaneously where I'm holding this down and gripping another one, stretching this out like this. Again, the interface just disappears here. There's no manual. This is exactly what you kind of expect, especially if you haven't interacted with a computer before. Now, when you have initiatives like the $100 laptop, yeah, I kind of cringe at the idea that we're going to introduce a whole new generation of people to computing with kind of this standard mouse and Windows pointer interface. This is something that I think is really the way we should be interacting with machines from this point on. <laughs> now, of course, I can bring up the keyboard. Yeah, you can bring up the keyboard. So I just wanted to show you that th we're using it in a really particular application, and, and it has definite limitations compared to something like this. But this is not commercially available yet. And so, it's because it, the, the same way that this technology took 10 years to really become popular to the point where it's ubiquitous, this is going to take some time too. And this is very expensive. I mean, it's not, it's, it's just not affordable right now. Well, what about um, the Johnny Lee, um, his technology was cheaper to create. Now, would that become available? And then he could sell it at a cheaper price. I'm he, sure he wouldn't he sell it. He actually gives away the software. He, he made the software, made it open source, and gives it away. Plus, he tells you how to make the devices that he is, has <coughs> designed in that video. In other words, just do a search on Johnny Lee, and you'll find his website. You'll, you can get the software. If you know how to solder, you could, you could make your own. So and you laugh at that, but I mean, no. lots of people know how to solder. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like uh, electronics. Yeah, it's not, but yeah. so technically, we can get hired. John be like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't spend that three grand. You know what? I'll make you one. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, it is amazing. And it's like, you know, <laughs> this is why I'm trying to make you guys aware of this, this idea, because the idea is more important than the object. You know what I mean? It's like, you can, you can go and make it what today. Else, how, what else did he, I mean, he said he used the Wii remote, but then he started talking about the pen. And then right, the pen time. was what he made. In other words, he bought the Wii remote, okay. he, he plugged it into a computer, probably via USB. The software has to be running in order for the, the Wii to interact with the computer, in the same way that we're running software here in order to have the whiteboard interact with the computer. Right. But the software cost us money. Right. This whiteboard cost us money. Right. He, he did away with all that and said, here's the software for free, here's the schematics in order to make your own pen. But what software did he use? Like he made it. He just... He made it. If you, I mean, if you want the gory details, he probably wrote it in C++ in a, in a programming language and then compiled it. Yes? Is it an actual, like, just a white screen like you would find in a school? I actually, like a pull down thing? I actually have not seen it other than the video. And so I imagine that it's a fairly loose interface right now. And you would probably either hire a programmer in, in order to make it exactly what you want because, as I said, the software is free and open source. And so... You can hand that to a developer, pay the developer 40 bucks an hour or whatever in order to develop precisely exactly what you need for your school, mm -hmm. and then you would, you would be able to resell it probably. Mm -hmm. But um, he's putting it out there as a prototype, as sort of like a pilot. It's, it is not commercially available at all. As a matter of fact, it's, it's like anti-commercial. Okay. You know? Yeah, is that what the, 
So, thank you very, very much for your time today. Um, oh, and as I said,